Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny. I'm the founder of Women in the Law UK, an organisation which is passionate about supporting the next leaders in law. I'm also a barrister based at Kenworthy's Chambers and a door tenant of Four Bream Buildings and the Joint Vice Chair of the Association of Women Barristers. On this month's episode, I'm thrilled to speak to Spanish international trade lawyer Miriam González Durantes, Lady Clegg. As well as practising law, Miriam is also the Vice Chair of UBS Europe, a company that provides investment advisory services, and she is a founder of the international charity Inspiring Girls. Hello, Miriam. Welcome to the Women in the Law podcast. We're delighted to have you with us. Can we start from the beginning? Many people will know you as an international lawyer. Uh, I suppose lay people not in the law will know you as Mrs. Clegg. But we, Women in the Law UK, know you for being a, a, a fantastic international lawyer. And I wanted to go back from the beginning and ask you, I'm fascinated by why you chose the law and how you became so successful, essentially from a, a small uh, village in rural Spain to an expert in international law. Well, it was by chance, uh, really. I never uh, managed to become a lawyer in private uh, practice. I never planned that. It simply happened. Uh, during uh, the time when I was studying, um, I had chosen humanities simply because um, I studied in my village and uh, my whole primary and secondary education. And my mother was the chemistry teacher and physics teacher. Oh, right. And so I was uh, determined not to be um, uh, with her as my teacher, and I chose <laughs> humanities. And as a result, when I finished uh, humanities, I thought about the possible um, careers and degrees to, to study at university. And, um, and law seemed like a rather broad um, option that would not close uh, many doors. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Yes. And it's fair to say that at the time, uh, many um, women um, of my generation, you know, when they didn't really know what to do and they didn't have a very clear vocation and had studied humanities, they could do a law degree because precisely because it keeps doors uh, open. So that's how I ended up um, with a law degree. But I have to say that for many years, I wasn't at all practicing as a lawyer. I was a trade negotiator and yes. then a, an advisor on foreign affairs. So it was only late in, in my professional life that I went back to private practice. Ah, I see. And what was the difference between that work and when you went to private practice? Some of our listeners are students. So, what, what you know, when you were dealing with trade negotiations, for example, were there skills that you used then when you became, uh, when you went into private practice? Well, some of the skills are similar, like being able to deal with huge amounts of, of information and distill what what is important to you or not. But then I think that in private practice, the analytical skills uh, are particularly important, especially in the kind of work that I do with sanctions, investigations, and so on. While in the world of trade negotiations and, and foreign affairs, there is much more of uh, the strategic understanding, the, in particular in the trade negotiations, about being able to, to have the instinct as to where the other part would be moving so that you can sort of choreograph it all. <laughs> and the to a trade negotiator is the one who makes the other side feel that they are winning when they have not. Yes. What was it about international trade that particularly fascinated you? And was it a very masculine world? I, I have always been drawn towards um, international issues, I, probably precisely because I come from a small village and I was born when Spain was still a dictatorship and, and the generation of my parents was very keen on, on telling us all that, you know, if we studied hard, we could do whatever we wanted and that rather than having that um, endogamic look at the country that uh, predominated during the dictatorship in Spain, that we should be looking outside. So they all encourage us to, to travel and to, to look abroad. And I think that that is why I have always been an internationalist. And, um, and pretty much everything that I have done in my career has been... <laughs> yes, 
at an international angle. And even now that I do quite a lot of political commentary in um, in Spain, I'm constantly trying to do the comparisons between the country and other countries. So that, that has always been a leitmotiv yes. of my career. And yes, it is, it is quite uh, masculine. I think that the... The trade world, um, trade law world in particular, and I set up one of the first specific trade practices in the in the city of London. It was particularly dominated by men because it tended to be done beforehand by corporate lawyers yes. who happened to do a little bit of sanctions here, a little bit of export controls. It wasn't really their main their main role. And as you know, the corporate world um, has traditionally been mostly men. Now it's changing a bit, but probably not fast enough. Yes. Often you'd probably be the only female voice around the table. Did you ever struggle to be taken seriously? Well, that happens still now. Yes. And it constantly surprises me that, you know, in the 21st century, third decade of the 21st <laughs> century, there are still so many occasions that I am the only woman at the table and also which is I think that much more significant that normally I'm the only one at that table who realizes that I'm the only woman. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think that we all need to do much more about highlighting whenever there is a real lack of, of female presence because sometimes people do not do not even notice. And I you know I have a struggle. I think that most women have a struggle at yeah. some point to uh, be taken seriously. We all have plenty of anecdotes when we have gone to a meeting with some men and um, and they assumed that they were the bosses when in fact the boss were you. That lasts half a second really for everybody to understand <laughs> uh, what is the hierarchy uh, there. But I, I normally advise people, you know, n- not to let the anger silence you. Make sure that everybody hears you. Don't become silent. Don't become aggressive. Just, you know, Take it naturally and, and normally within a few minutes, everybody understands what is your value if you have value because you have yes. to work with value. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, can I ask you, can you remember a case or a job that shifted things in your career or shifted your reputation? Not so much um, a case. And, you know, though I have had um, crucial cases for me um Obviously, the kind of work I do very related to compliance, I would not be able to um, uh, to talk about it or I would have to kill you. <laughs> I know, I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> something that really um, made a big difference um, to me was uh, Brexit. Yes. And, and up till then, um, I was doing a lot of work for corporates and for countries and um, and trade was considered a little bit of a specialized um, advice. And then suddenly Brexit happened and put trade squarely within the everyday agenda. And, and it meant that reputationally, it became much more of a of an open kind of work and, and lots of people started knowing about the kind of advice that I provided. And I have to say that that is happening in the US as well, mostly thanks to President Trump, yes. who has put trade again on the agenda. So, so it has been quite interesting to find that I started doing something quite specialized and, yes. and now um, it is rather fashionable to do trade law. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope we get more women doing it. <laughs> Uh, Just on that point, how has the move to the US been? Have you, you know, rebuilt your career? You know, we know that you're um, on the board of USB uh, and so on. But I I just wondered, you know, how that's transcended moving your family across and how you're finding working in the US. Well, for me, it was quite straightforward because being an international trade lawyer, I was uh, always used to working from wherever. And the amount of work that I have done from airports throughout my professional <laughs> life, people would be really surprised to, yeah. to hear. So, so that hasn't been so much of an issue. And I continue doing pretty much the same kind of advice and, and sometimes even for the for the same clients. Uh, the time difference is brutal and um, and you have to adapt to that and to the fact that when you put together the deadlines with the time difference, you need to be even more organized that, uh, that you were before. And and the, the other bigger difference for me has been to, to understand the market here, which is a rather 
closed market, but is very, very exposed to European regulation in particular. And there is a lack of understanding of how that regulation is developed, uh, how it affects them, you know, what can be done um, multilaterally. And, and that is, I'm finding that fascinating, really, because it is companies mostly with huge ideas here. They think very, very big. But still, there is quite a lot of, of lack of understanding of some of the regulation in, in other parts of, of the world. So, it's, you know, it's a, it's a great challenge and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Absolutely. Gosh, you're so clever. You're amazing, really. I don't know if I, I could do it. Um, so do it. Everybody can do it. Everyone <laughs> could do it. Actually, that's a big plug. Come on, girls. Um, and I'll come on in, in a moment to Inspiring Girls Global. But um, can I just ask you this before? You are, of course, um, uh, your husband is the... the of course, a former leader of the Liberal Democrats and was former, formerly the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Nick Clegg. I just wondered how his political success affected your career as a lawyer and, and how you cope with the additional pressures that a public scrutiny added to your life. Well, I try to keep things um, rather separately from from the very beginning. And I, I was lucky in a way that... When Nick became part of the government, there had already been other women, namely Cherie Blair, who yes. had been working and had um, a husband who did an even more prominent uh, job, Prime yes. Minister, um, yes. at the time. So, so in a way, I was the lucky one who had already <laughs> seen how how she had coped with it, and um, and I tried to impose very clear barriers on on the kind of free time and how much was expected from me yes uh, in the political uh, world and and I think that probably because um, I was very open about it at the beginning and and to be fair probably also because I'm Spanish and I was considered the foreigner and you know you <laughs> get a little bit more latitude um uh, when you are in that situation, it it worked rather well and never really had any big issues. You you accept that you have um, to submit yourself to a system of conflicts, and and for me it implied that I had to tell all my clients that I would need to give their name to the ethics office so that everybody could check at any point whether there could be any tiny possibility of a conflict. But you get used to that very quickly and obviously if the clients are good clients and they have a trust relationship with you that is normally never uh, a problem and for me it was never a problem and and then you accept that the rest of the public is scrutiny and having from time to time a, you know not a journalist who would aim to dig into something or so which is not appropriate you just you, know, you accept it as part of the territory and um, provided that you don't get too worked up about it yeah. <laughs> It doesn't affect you. Yeah. Well, I asked that question because Shri Blair, who's been on this podcast, talked about the challenges of uh, uh, fulfilling the diplomatic appointments and uh, expected of a wife of a politician whilst uh, sustaining a challenge in Korean law. So I, I just wondered how, how it was for you and whether you know you were ever pressured to um, step back from your career and uh, available to support your husband, I suppose. So, um, anyway, that's why I was asking that question. Now, yeah. I know you've got three boys. I've got two boys and a daughter, and I and you have a successful career. How do you look after your well-being? How do you juggle? Uh, and really, is the structure of the legal profession good for supporting mental and physical well-being for people who work within it? Well, there's lots of questions packed into one. <laughs> Um, I, I deal with it badly, uh, basically, because when I am in one particular place, I'm quite diligent about mm. spending time running. And, and for me, that has been um, a lifesaver, really, because it's not only good for the body, but it's particularly good for the mind. And my best ideas tend to happen either when I'm running or when I'm doing something related to the house, like doing the dishes or, <laughs> or whatever. But, uh, you know, you need some of those routine yes. um, moments um, in order to be able to think um, properly. And um, and I do kind of weights and have started doing Pilates and so on. But it is also true that whenever I have to travel, my whole schedule goes out of the window. Yes. <laughs> 
restart again. And the beginning of restarting that process is always painful to find the, the will to get into into the routine again. And I, I know I don't think that uh, the legal profession by and large is good about the well-being, physical and mental of its workers. And, and sometimes I think that we are still such an old fashioned industry you know, and and you see people piling up the hours. You know, at the end of the day, many of us sell time, which is a yes. quite weird concept mm. in this day and age. And and it's like if many have not evolved into thinking we should be looking at results and, you know, the, the more integrated the teams, the better, the happier the teams, the better and the healthier the teams, the better. I think that there are many other industries that have done that that uh, work um, on updating themselves much more than us and, and for us it's still a bit of homework. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, one of your children, like my own child, was diagnosed with cancer and needed a transplant and I just wondered how you coped work-wise and as a family with that. When in one's life, career is everything but then life and something big like that with your children, I know with my son, get, you know, happens. How did you manage to cope and how did the family manage to cope? Well, Antonio didn't need a transplant, but he needed chemotherapy. And um, and when that happens, um, obviously your job takes um, a, a very secondary role, but it is also true that you become rather pragmatic. And I remember thinking, we cannot simply give up everything because we don't know how this is going to develop and what kind of resources we are going to need. Uh, to deal with this. So you are constantly trying to think about um, how you keep things going, but obviously changing completely uh, yes. your priorities while while that is happening. And, and for me, you know, I, I had to accept it and I had to accept that um, during a couple of years, it was much more difficult to, to keep my practice at the level that I had it, I was super lucky because I had a really, really good team that knew me very well, and <laughs> and then it's easier to 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 make sure that things uh, go on. But there is no doubt that when big things happen in your life related to health, you know sometimes you have to make uh, compromises, and uh, you know I would make those compromises. Anytime. <laughs> yes, yes, me too, me too. Thank you for sharing that. Now, can I ask you about your charity work and the amazing Inspiring Girls? What is Inspiring Girls and why did you set it up? The Inspiring Girls is a very simple idea. It's about connecting female role models with girls and showing to girls all the, the kind of 12, 14 years old girls, all the many things that women already do so that they can choose freely what they want to do themselves and also so that we can inspire them to uh, and help them to go in whatever direction they want and and we showcase all sorts of women is by no means only the CEOs of the big investment banks yes. it's, uh, it's those and also women who are starting and in any kind of job and old women young women whatever it is we really believe in the whole concept of diversity and and uh, and also showing all the possible all the possible options all that it requires is one hour of your time per year and we make it super simple now because you don't even need to go physically to the schools but uh, we have a tool now to be able to do it remotely using technology and and also to reach out to pretty much every girl with access to internet in the world but physically we are in 15 different countries already wow. and we are hoping to reach 20 uh, wow. this year 2020 which is a good <laughs> yes absolutely good number <laughs> exactly and and i i launched it i'm the founder of the idea and also the chair but i i originally had the idea because um i saw some research from the girl guides that if you are into gender issues they are a really good source of research because they have access to lots of girls, mm. that more than 55% of the girls said that they felt themselves that they didn't have enough access to female role models. And I thought, well, you know, how absurd, because I on my own know thousands of amazing women who yes. are not in, in newspapers, magazines, glossy magazines, television all the time, but they are amazing. So I would love to show them 
to the girls, and 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 that's what we did. And you know, I was completely surprised to see the the enormous success that it had from the very beginning. And and wherever we go to a country, we continue having. <laughs> the same reaction and i'm convinced that there are so many people eager to help and that's the only thing that they need is somebody telling them you know here this is what you can do in concrete terms and they go and do it yeah absolutely and who are your role models well i i grew up in a village in the middle of nowhere in spain really and there were not very many women uh working there my mom probably was one of the ones who was most determined to, <laughs> yes. to keep her career and and having to defend that she wasn't disrespecting my father by doing so. So obviously my mother and my grandfather also had a, a tremendous impact on me by insisting, you know, that I should study and do well and so on. But then when I was a foreign affairs advisor, one of the women who really had a big impact on me was Anna Lind, who was the foreign affairs minister of Sweden. Yes. He was sadly assassinated. Yeah. Uh, you're a skeptic, um, actually. And um, and she was young and uh, there were not very female ministers around. And, and I remember that she came, you know, all the ones who were there, power dress and so on. And there came this woman just with trousers and then looked almost like a t-shirt and she didn't even have a briefcase she had a back backpack and <laughs> and i remember just drinking it all <laughs> and trying to mimic her and so on and she she had young children and i it was when i started having young children i remember her telling me you know you have to set your boundaries if you cannot do cocktails in the evening just say that you have a no evenings policy. And and the yeah. first time I say to an ambassador, said to an ambassador, I have a no evenings policy. And I sort of closed my eyes thinking, oh, my God, this is the end of my career. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. Everybody accepted it. So she was actually very, very influential on me. That's a, such a good policy. I'm going to remember that. Um, <laughs> can I ask you, you have, of course, three boys. How do you view men's role in the fight for equality? Oh, I think that is absolutely crucial. And to me, this is the main thing that has changed over the last few years, probably because of the Me Too campaign. That, yeah. that was such a big moment that that many men started thinking, you know, some of these behaviours that we have accepted was it okay for us to to think that this was normal or not and and i think that that trigger many men just thinking about equal rights and feminism more widely and and for me you know that has changed the whole thing because now it's a transversal (laughs) movement (laughs) and now it's just a question of time how how we get there no whenever something becomes transversal in society you know of course it's it always works and at an anecdotal level when i started inspiring girls it was only women really who came yes to the meeting that we did at companies and so on telling people about the campaign then kind of two to three years later we started getting the fathers of daughters coming and now it's amazing you know we have all sorts of men fathers of daughters and fathers of sons and and men without children and they all want to participate and and I'm thinking now constantly what can we do for them to do because they keep saying (laughs) how can we help so we need to give them things to do and what what sort of what lessons do you teach your boys then in all of this are there anything I don't know if if we teach the boys any any different apart from making my my boys take their food to their plate but uh, to the um to the sink and trying to get them to start the dishwasher, but it becomes a problem then. Um, are there any, any any lessons that you teach your boys? That's a problem for teenagers, whether they're boys or girls, <laughs> in my experience. But, but generally, you know, I, I don't go around just lecturing my children about, mm. um, you know, feminism and equality and so on. I, I think that they see it in the house yeah. and, uh, and they get it through osmosis almost, you no, know, because whenever there is respect and and even Nick and I, you know, we don't do fifty fifty every day and I handle mentally much more of the house yeah. than he does, even when I have been busier than than he has been. So so there are lots of things that you could point to thinking, you know, this can be done 
differently. But the basic respect and considering each other as equal and suddenly one needs to do something and the other one steps in and so on, I think that that is the main thing that they see. And in my experience, not only my children, but that whole generation, they really have equality in their DNA. They cannot understand the discriminations. It is us who bring the discriminations to them. So the best thing that we can do with all that new generation is is not to interfere too much, really, yeah. because they are much better than us when it comes to equality. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I ask, what are you most proud of in your career? Well, I'm very proud of having kept the family together throughout uh, the years when Nick was under intense public scrutiny. And I think that we are very proud as a family to have come out of that and and then out of a very serious illness without being bitter people. And we have always retained a sense of happiness and sense of humor. And I think that that is probably the best thing that we can leave to our children. Oh, I'd love that. And how is your son now? He's very well. He's very well. Thank you very much. He's recovered. And, uh, you know, you have to make always a bit of a mental effort not to feel victim of a cancer that you no longer have. Yes. So you have to work mentally on, on some of that. And, and I myself, you know, I, I imagine that you know it um, mm, probably better than I do, but you lose a little bit of the trust in the body. And, yes. <laughs> and you know, you normally looked at your children and you knew whether they were well or bad. And then when you have an experience like this, you think, oh, perhaps, you know, they look well, but I don't know. They yeah. may have something terrible inside. Yeah. So you, yeah. Mentally, have to work um, on it but we are really really lucky because he has fully recovered absolutely absolutely have you got any advice for young women who want to rise to the top well i th- i think that is always very important not to hide your ambition and, and not to feel guilty about your ambition not everybody wants to go to the top of whatever it is But if you want and if you really have that ambition, you don't need to be constantly, you know, apologizing (laughs) for it. It's absolutely legitimate to do so. You obviously need to put that together with hard work. And it's just just not okay for everybody to want to go up there without being able to, you know, put the effort that it takes to get there. But I, I normally keep meeting lots of women who, you know, you can see that they are eager to go farther. And and there is a little bit of, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry that I want to do this. Like, don't be sorry for this. You, you have every right to want to be at the very top of your profession. And I hope you do. Yes. And um, can I ask, is there one thing that you want to change to ensure that the legal profession remains relevant for the next decade, maybe? Um, you know, we celebrated 100 years of women in the law last year, just in December. Is, is there any one thing so that we remain relevant? Well, for me, I think that something that is really important is to bring back integrity to the centre of the legal profession. I think that because it has become very much of a business with with big companies around too much focus is being put on on generating money almost at any cost and at the end of the day we have the same uh, rules that apply in pretty much every other job which is that we need to do things with integrity and never cutting corners and never stepping <laughs> over the red line and that to me whether you are a man or a woman continues being the most important thing in the legal profession. And then more generally, I think that we just need to start modernizing the profession. It's just not okay that there are still so many lawyers who feel forced to go to an office from 7 a.m. till 10, 11, whatever, work in the weekends. And sometimes you say like, what what exactly are you doing there that you cannot from somewhere else with a computer? You know, it's just most of my clients don't know where I am at any point. So why can't we just modernize this profession so that we can make it a little bit more human and we don't lose all the talent that we are losing, in particular women, I think, that many women abandon when they become senior associates and they cannot make it to partner before they have children. And it's such a pity because it's fantastic talent for the profession. Yeah, absolutely. You, of course, have written several books. You know, how did the writing come about? And then I'll ask you who your favourite fictional lawyer is and your favourite book. 
Well, I, I have done um, three books. The first one was pretty much about um, something I was working on, which was the World Trade Organization rules on telecom. So that was pretty straightforward because uh, I was a co-author and, um, and it was just about, you know, downloading my knowledge of those negotiations, basically. And then, very oddly, I did a cookbook because I found, <laughs> <laughs> people look at me like if I'm mad when I tell them this. <laughs> but, uh, but I run a, 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 an inter- a blog with uh, my children on cooking and I did it in a hidden manner when it was in government and and I was very, very keen to internationalize um, inspiring girls. Yes. Um, and I need some money to do that. So somebody came with, out with the idea of why don't you put your blog into a, a cooking book? And um, and then we sell that. And with that money, we just we just start Inspiring Girls, which is wow. what I do. Wow. And I, some, <laughs> some ideas and anecdotes to make it a bit more relevant and so on. And I have to say, with all that money, we've managed to launch in the first four countries. So I'm really very grateful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then the very last thing that I have done, which I have just published, is a is a book on liberalism and politics and, and a sort of critique and, and ideas to go forward um, in in Spain from the yes. political point of view. And that, to me, it has been a pleasure writing it because I I love politics and I love my country and and I never understand why countries. Do not start copying each other much more and getting the good ideas from one country into another country. So it has been wonderful to put that together. And I was, you know, it became a bestseller and, you know, I was really delighted with the whole process. Well, I've, I've tried to order that book. It is in Spanish. So I've asked some of my women in the law, UK uh, lawyers, albeit, you know, we're in Manchester as our headquarters, lots of Spanish people here to translate. So I hope it arrives soon. I don't know if it is it in English. Have you got an English version coming out? Uh, it's not. And it's very much about the Spanish system. So I, I'm not sure how it would go down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've got Man City and Man United here, so, you know, it'll go down very well. And and do you have a favourite fictional lawyer? Well, you would not be very surprised because pretty much every lawyer that I know thinks of Atticus Finch. And oh, yes, yes. <laughs> or if you read that, I don't know whether it's fair um, or not, but you read that normally as I did during your teenager years. Yeah. And those books always have much more impact on you than anything else that comes um, afterwards. But actually, I think that, that that focus that he had on integrity you know, is something that I believe very much in. Absolutely. Um, and do you have a, a, um, a quote that you live your life by? Do you have a, a quote that's meaningful to you? Well, not so much a quote, but I, I believe a lot on the keep trying. You, know? you stand up again and you just keep trying. And when you come to my age and I'm 51, you realize that, you know, nothing is linear. So you have good moments and bad moments. And sometimes you put an enormous amount of effort into something and you think that you deserve something and it doesn't work out. And and you feel at that moment that, you know, this is going to be a disaster for the rest of your life. And I'm finding the, you know, the energy and the effort to say, okay, one more step, just try one more time <laughs> and see what happens. You, you, you don't need to map out your whole life just once more, one more time. I, that to me has always helped me um, a lot. And, and sometimes you are surprised when you look backwards to think that things that you wanted and seemed, you know, so important in your life, actually it was for the better <laughs> that yes. it didn't work out. So yeah, just keep going. Miriam Gonzalez Duranthes, Lady Clegg, thank you so much for talking on the Talking Law podcast. Thank you again for listening to Talking Law with me, Sally Penny. Leave us a review on the podcast. We'd love to hear what you think. You can find all the details of our latest professional development events, our networking events, masterclasses, conferences, and annual dinner at womeninthelawuk.com. And of course, do follow us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram, at Women in the Law UK, and of course, on LinkedIn too. Until next time, we look forward to connecting with you. Bye for now.